post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD is a real, real problem. Not just for people who experienced it, but for their loved ones and people around them. It is a psychiatric disorder that may occur in people who have experienced or witnessed a traumatic event. And some may not get the help they need to overcome it. More often than not, it could lead to death. Joining us now is retired Army Sergeant First Class Dan Jarvis, who was deployed to a combat zone in Afghanistan in 2011. He had a traumatic brain injury shortly after his arrival. After he stepped on a pressure plate and detonated an IED, also stand for Improvised Explosive Device. Then, because of the blast, you couldn't sleep for weeks, and yet, you have to lead your troops onto the battlefield instead of taking a break. Tell us what happened next. Yeah, so the IED blast was, it was literally about five, 10 feet away from me on a dismounted patrol. Um, pretty much knocked me off my bearing. Um, I was leading a patrol with four Americans and four Afghanis with an interpreter. And we really kind of got put into a bad situation. Um, I hit the ground and my, I, I snapped the antenna on my radio. I couldn't even communicate. We had an element that was up on top of a mountain and we couldn't communicate with them. We could hear them, but we couldn't push traffic to them. We were just trying to get them not to come looking for us because we didn't know if there were secondaries or the follow on ambush. But, you know, the, the, the sleep deprivation, you know, was it almost was immediately. So like probably the next few days, um, the battalion surgeon took me off the battle roster for about seven days. And every time my guys were out of patrol, I'm back on the base. I mean, all I wanted to do was get back with my guys, but I'd, I'd close my eyes. And as soon as I closed my eyes, I would hear an explosion. Um, this happened a few times where um, my heart's racing, you know, 160 beats a minute. I'm up trying to put my gear on, actually thinking we were under attack again. And this kind of went on for a while. And when I realized that there was something else going on, it was like, well, first of all, there was no attacks coming in. And second, nobody else you know, was reacting to it. So that was just a very regular thing. I got to the point where I would, I'd hear that explosion and I'm up and I'm literally up for the rest of the night, whether we're on patrol or off patrol. So I just kind of like, it kind of, you know, made me into like, like a zombie, but you know, when you're in a leadership position, you don't want to take yourself off that battle roster. You know, you feel like you have an obligation and responsibility to your men. So I wanted to be, I wanted to be doing patrols with my guys. I wanted to be leading in combat. Um, and, and I was just so fatigued and it was about three weeks after the event where I got, I got blasted. Uh, we lost a uh, soldier, Doug Cordo in a, uh, a convoy with an IED attack and my job, you know, I was in a lead striker. It was a, it's an eight wheeled light armored vehicle. It's an infantry troop tra transport. Um, so we had a, I had my full squad in my vehicle. And as the front truck commander, my job is to actually look for the IEDs as we went off road, um, find them, exploit it, and then bring up the explosives guys to work on it. And we went over um, the IED without even realizing it. Um, it was very well hidden and it detonated on the fourth vehicle in our order of, of movement. So Doug was driving the fourth vehicle, it was a main gun system. So it was a striker with a, a 105 howitzer on it. So it was specifically targeted because it was like a tank on wheels. And uh, and I remember that day, it was August 19th, 2011. It was a 9.36 in the morning. And uh, when I when I missed it, that's when I really had a, a serious heart to heart with myself because then part of me was like, you know, had I had the courage to step up and say, hey, LT, you know, I'm not 100%. I need somebody else up front. Would he still be here? You know, that's the, that's the survivor guilt that many of us deal with. Um, and that just kind of like, carried through the deployment and it was you know quite a while uh, four of my men got medevaced out of country didn't return to the fight and then doug was killed and uh, at the very end of my deployment i got a red cross notice and i lost my mother she had a massive heart attack so my last three weeks i had to leave afghanistan early to go home and and do funeral arrangements and then i found myself back in alaska at fort wainwright um first thing i did when i got back i'm by myself my unit's still deployed first thing i did was go to the class six, which is a liquor store on base. And I bought a case of beer and I drank until I slept. And that became my routine. I did that for, um, you know, probably a good year. I can't even imagine how it feels, but I know it's extremely, extremely painful. You, you lost 
uh, someone that's dearest to you, that's dark, and, and, and made, made a matter even worse, your mother also passed while you were deployed, and it reached to a point that you contemplated suicide. Run us through that dark moment in your life, would you? You know, like I said, it, I, we returned in April of 2012, and by March of 2013, my whole routine, I mean, I, I literally would drink just to sleep. Um, night sweats, night terrors, you know, all the things that come along with trauma and post-traumatic stress. Uh, but nobody had ever labeled me with PTSD. And I didn't want a label, I didn't seek a label. Um, and I thought about, well, how do I get help? You know, do I do I just self-refer? Do I do I do EAP? And then my fear was that the commanders were gonna find out, my men were gonna find out, and then I would lose respect. So um, I got to the point where I was just sick and tired of being sick and tired. And it's not that I wanted to die. I didn't want to die. I was just, I didn't want that to be the rest of my life. And it was March 2nd of 2013. I'm looking at a rifle in the corner of my room and I'm ready to go. Um, and then I hear the kids in the apartment above me running across the, the floor or my their floor, my ceiling. And I was like, whoa, this is a horrible idea. You know, I had a high powered rifle. I didn't want to hurt a child or a parent of a child. And I knew that if I did, it would go right through that, that ceiling. Um, so I just passed out that night, like every other night. And the next morning, I get a phone call from Ryan, who was one of my soldiers. And he's like, hey, Sergeant Jarvis, did you hear about Corey? And I'm like, no, buddy, what happened? And he said, Corey shot and killed himself last night. So Corey was a 22-year-old soldier that was in the platoon that I had just come out of maybe six weeks prior that nobody had a clue was even struggling. Maybe his closest friends knew, but leadership didn't know. I mean, the kid was always had a smile on his face, always trying to help other people. Um, and, you know, hindsight's always 2020, but I always say Corey saved my life. Unfortunately, it's when he took his own. But just seeing how it affected the men, I didn't want that. I didn't want to green light any of my guys to do the same thing. And, and I just kind of pushed through it I and mean, just, you know, I, I, I still self-medicated. I still self-isolated. Um, I didn't like weekends. I didn't like a lot of time off. You know, I try to keep my mind as busy as possible, and keep those thoughts, you know, in control. There are a lot, a lot of people, uh, when they go through the darkest moment in their life, they couldn't have that breakthrough. Mm -hmm. And based on your true stories, you are going through to th that dark moment. What exactly happened that got you from the darkest moment and doing what you do now? I mean, it's pretty amazing. And uh, right. would, you, would you mind to unpack that for us? Yeah, sure. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize the, the way the human body and the physiology works, um, the, the vagus nerve, the 10th cranial nerve, all of that stuff is where all the emotions come from. So us guys, typically we have about eight emotions that we're very familiar with. We know what they are. You know, ladies, you know, typically sometimes there's a 16 crayon pack there and they don't know what those emotions are. We don't. And then trauma is all of the emotions in your body coming together at the same time. That's the, that's the PTSD emotion and it's very confusing. Just feeling that all the time, you know, just kind of that's that's what brought you to that, that dark point. Uh, but I, at the time, I didn't realize that emotions come in 90 second waves, you know, and it's in that 90 second wave that we lose a lot of the veterans and first responders. They just get overwhelmed with those emotions. You know, for me, you know, when I when I retired, you know, the honeymoon leaving the service lasted about three, four days and then reality set in. The nightmares weren't stopping. The intrusive thoughts weren't stopping. But I did something uh, kind of crazy. I traded one uniform in for another, and I started working as a law enforcement officer in Central Florida. And the weirdest thing happened, the moment that uniform went back on, I felt normal again. I was like, okay, I can do this. And I know now why, it's because first responders, every day is fight or flight, every day their brain is operating that way. So you feel like you're supposed to. It's when everything stops, when you have all that time that's when you feel like a fish out of water. That's where, that's when the struggles come in. So I, I got involved, you know, I worked with a police department, you know, I worked crime suppression. So I did a lot of street level narcotics interdiction and I felt like I was supposed to and everything was going well. And then I realized, you know, being 45 years old at the time, chasing 20 year, 20 year old kids through the woods of central Florida just didn't seem like a good use of my time. Um, it's definitely a young person's sports, um, profession. Um, so I ended up, I got vested in the Florida retirement system. I, I left that profession and that's when everything kind of came back again. And um, I was married at the time and, and my wife, my ex-wife now was like, 
you know, you really need to go talk to somebody because all of the nightmares came back. About two, it took about, about two weeks. As soon as that list of things to do around the house stopped and I had time, you know, nightmares came back, intrusive thoughts came back, all those emotions were coming back. That desire to self-medicate was starting to come back. And so I went to the VA like majority of the other veterans out there do. And first thing they do is here's a prescription, go take some, go fill the prescription bottle. I'm like, well, I don't want pills. And then they give you a label and I didn't want a label either. They diagnosed me with post-traumatic stress disorder with major depressive disorder. And the only thing I heard in that conversation was disorder, disorder. You know, I didn't want to be broken. I wanted to get healthy and wanted to get fixed. Um, so I ended up going through the VA's treatment. They use a process called prolonged exposure. Uh, and that's where you start from the beginning of an event. Like, let's take the day we lost Doug. You retell the whole story from beginning to the end. And you do this for 12 weeks. And then they give you homework assignments, you know, listen to taps for an hour every day inside your office at your house. You know, go sit in a restaurant with your back to a door, just crazy things. And the, I, I went to two sessions. Uh, then the VA had called to cancel my third and I couldn't get in for four weeks. And then I went back for another session. And then they canceled the following one after that. And they couldn't get me in for eight weeks. And I'm like, holy cow, this is going to be a long time. And, you know, my wife was like, wow, you're, you're, you seem like you're getting worse because what they did is they forced me to open up that box that I had done a really good job of packing it away and keeping things out. Um, so I'm like, okay, something else, there's gotta be something out there. There has to be something better than what this is. So I ended up going on a journey of, of looking for alternative treatments. Um, and then I was invited to a men's leadership retreat in Tampa, Florida. And I met a gentleman there from Albuquerque, New Mexico. He's an Air Force veteran. And we were talking and he started talking about an organization that he's been doing fundraising for that is an alternative treatment for PTSD. So he didn't know my story at the time, uh, but he piqued my interest. And then that was the weekend I decided, you know what? I love veterans. I love first responders, people who put a uniform on for a purpose bigger than self. That was the moment I said 22-0. Somebody, you know, Scott, the guy who helped led the group, he said, Dan, you look like you have something you want to say. And I said, yeah, 22-0. He's like, well, what's that? I said, we're losing 22 veterans every day in the United States. We're going to take it to zero, right? I didn't know how we were going to do that, but I knew that's what I, that's what the goal was. So um, started the nonprofit, started the organization, started laying all the foundational groundwork, started looking for alternative treatments, and then started finding some, some successful alternative treatments. And then we wanted to be like, um, we wanted to be able to stand in the gap between the men and women who needed the help and the men and women who could provide it. So that's initially how things started. And then I was invited uh, about six months later to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico for the first public training. And I'm listening to this organization talk about PTSD and how quickly it can be healed. And I'm like, I hate to tell you this, you know, I, I, I pretty much called BS on the, on the lead trainer. I'm like, you know, combat, law enforcement, but it don't, it doesn't compare to what happened when I was 11. You know, you're telling me that you can fix this in three to five hours. And I'm like, well, if I'm gonna recommend this to anybody, I want to experience it. So the trainer was like, his name was Alan. He goes, you wanna, you wanna do it today? I'm like, absolutely. Because you wanna do it in like 10 minutes? I'm like, sooner the better. Because you wanna sit in front of the class of mental health counselors and be the live demonstration? I'm like, I've carried a gun for a living. I'm not scared of people, let's roll. You know, basically I was gonna prove this guy that he was crazy. And in that process, you talk about the event until you trigger. And then they stop you and then they set up this visual kinesthetic um, disassociation process. So I go through, I, mean, I triggered pretty quickly, which was awkward in front of people you don't even really know. Um, and then we got out of that emotion, you know, we were talking about trucks or something, something fully off topic. And then they set this process up and there's a part where you do a rapid rewind. And then it goes, okay, now tell the story. And I, I told the story and I kept telling it and I kept telling it and I kept waiting for those emotions to hit and they weren't hitting. And I'm like, okay, what kind of Jedi stuff is this? Because this is crazy. I could not tell that story 40 minutes ago or 45 minutes ago, but I'm telling the story like there's no emotions attached to it. And I remember talking to the founder of that process. I'm like, you know, when I was in my darkest hour, if I'd have known that this was even available, I would have wrote you a check for 10,000 bucks. Easy, all day long. This, this body of work has been around for quite some time, actually. Um, it's it's in the world of neuro-linguistic programming. And the visual kinesthetic disassociation was actually developed for phobia cures, like 
fear of frogs, fear of heights, you know, fear of, of closed spaces. All we did was we went back to the work, we modeled the processes and kind of geared it towards PTSD. And the remarkable part is the veterans and first responders don't have to tell us the first thing about the trauma that they've experienced, right? We don't have to talk about it to trigger. We can think about it and trigger. We're, we were, we're experts at it. So we just have them think about those events. They trigger, they have that reaction. And then they, we stop it, we reground them, and then we set up their process. We do that same visual kinesthetic that the other process did without any details. Uh, and you're seeing people go from, you know, a zero to 10 level, like zero is no stress and 10 is highly intense. We're seeing tens drop down to zeros and ones uh, in a 35, 40 minute period of time. And even people with, you know, complex trauma, you know, I had one of the guys in our unit that I deployed to Afghanistan with, uh, he died by suicide um, on May the 11th of this year. So, I mean, I literally put out a video into our closed Facebook group for the Legionnaires. And I'm like, look, there are real solutions. You don't have to go out this way. And one of the guys connected with me, um, I knew him, I wasn't friends with him, but I knew his story. And, you know, we connected and I'm, I'm like, look, this is, this is what it is. And, you know, he was like, well, I'm going to be honest, it sounds ridiculous. I said, ridiculous, this sounds dumb. I have no idea how this works. It just does. You know, instead of like positioning with our process, I took his position. We developed a little bit more rapport. And I said, look, I, I need you to be sober when you do this. You know, and Chris was like, I haven't been sober in a decade. And I'm like, well, I need you. And the moment you get off work, just call me. You know, because that same conversation, he's like, I got a bottle of Tito's in one hand and I got a 45 in the other and I'm trying to figure out which one to go to. I'm like, put the 45 away, stick with your Tito's and then call me when you're sober and let's do this. So I booked two hours, two days later, he finally calls me and says, okay, I'm sober. I just got off work, I worked all night. I said, all right, I'm sending you a link. We got on a Zoom call, two hours. He had three traumatic incidents in his life. We, we neutralized the trauma connected to all of them. And then we went through a different process with all of his negative emotions like anger, sadness, fear, shame, hurt, survivor guilt, anxiety. And we neutralized all of those feelings. And basically what that does is it resets the autotomic nervous system. It literally takes the body from fight or flight into parasympathetic rest and digest. And all of a sudden this guy goes back to normal sleep patterns. You know, and a few days later, he's sending me a text message saying how much he loves me and what I've done for him in his life and his family. You know, and it's like, those are, I mean, I have story after story after story of veterans and first responders who were actively suicidal, who are not. And, you know, the, the, the difficult part about what we do is we are disrupting a system, right? The, the mainstream mental health system, the medical model, the Western model, it's all about profitability. And what we're doing is we're removing, we're removing the profit out of that situation. Uh, how many therapists? I mean, this is amazing. I'm, I'm just listening to your stories, and you know, I, I you know, I, it's amazing how you kind of go over this whole thing without me even asking you any questions. I mean, I had a list of questions in my mind I was going to ask you, but you really made it easy today and just kind of like went through the whole thing uh, on this interview. How many therapists are working with you and helping all these people who's uh, having the PTSD uh, symptoms? So for licensed therapists, we've trained about 20 nationally. Um, but coaches, we've got about 100, I want to say 120. Um, and, and some of those are at police departments because we're actually starting to train first responders to utilize this in their peer support and in their um, you know crisis negotiation team. So um, I'd say full, you know, 100 percent on our mission, we got about 20 that are really active at, wow. at working with people. So like what we do is we'll get a request for help and then we'll do an assessment. So we'll score them to see where they fall on the PTS scale and then we'll place them with the right coach. You know, some people we've got Army vets, Navy, Air Force, Marines. You know, we've got another training coming up in October where we're going to have a couple active duty Coast Guard, you know, active law enforcement, prior law enforcement. And, you know, the, the key is getting as many people trained as possible, because in America, we've got about, I, I want to say it's about 1.1 million uh, people, veterans that are diagnosed with PTSD and about 11 million, between nine and 11, uh, that are civilians. And, and that's just diagnosed. That's not even 
that's probably double who, who just have not gone um, to seek treatment. I mean, you look at our, you know, look at law enforcement. I guarantee you that if you were to do assessments on every police department across the country, I'd say half of them would probably score out in that PTSD threshold just because of what they continually experience on a day to daily basis. You know, so that to, to me, that's exciting because, you know, when you see what's happening with law enforcement right now in the United States, you know, it's like an us versus them mentality. And we got to stop that. We got to find ways to disconnect those triggers in the law enforcement officers so that they have better interactions with the public. Because if you have a healthy police officer who doesn't have any trauma or any trauma response or any kind of emotional response, the interaction is going to be significantly better because I've, I've witnessed you know, you know, law enforcement officers trigger really quickly. I'm like, dude, wasn't that serious? But it was because they triggered to something that happened four years ago, you know, and it's that kind of stuff that we can disconnect and create healthier police departments and healthier communities. Talk about your foundation. Uh, that's 220. I think it's an amazing, very meaningful name. And uh, you have a great cause, you know, you have a great, great purpose. Why is it so important for the community to help your organization? Well, because right now, every community across the United States is being affected by the epidemic of suicides. You know, even just through the COVID, uh, suicides are going through the roof. The largest growing population of suicide is adolescents. You know, kids are becoming disconnected from their friends, you know, and they're, they're losing hope, you know. So for us, you know, we're trying to, the whole purpose of the zero, we're not anchored to the number 22. Right? We're not anchored to 22 veteran suicides, right? We're moving to the zero. And as soon as we get to the zero, you know, and we become irrelevant as an organization, then we win. You know, mission, we go on to a different mission. You know, we've even gone as far as we trained a therapist in Australia, and she's working with veterans and first responders in Australia. You know, it's not just an American problem, it's a global problem. You go to any community around the world, you know, there's a serious issues when it comes to mental health. You know, and it's the one thing, you know, we, we give the less care and consideration for. You know, you break an arm, right? You put a cast on it. You go to the doctor, they put a cast on it. The, the arm heals. You know, that's the way we look at PTSD. We look at PTSD as an injury versus an illness. And if we if we acknowledge it as an injury, injury we're going to try to do what we can to heal it. And that's, that's what we're doing. You know, and, and the, the success rates are just off the chain and, and are actually a little bit on the unbelievable side. You know, because in all of the studies that we've done, 100% of them, those that do the processes heal, every one of them, you know, not just 80% or 70%, all of them. And, and that's why it's so important for us to do this as a peer support model, because these processes have nothing to do with, it's got everything to do with rapport. You got to get that person on the other side of the camera to trust you enough to actually go through and do the visuals as you instruct it, because as the way I've learned it, once you do those visuals as instructed, the brain takes over, you can't stop it. So we've had We've had skeptics, we've had engineers, we've had you know people of all spectrums, you know, trying to dispute things, and all of a sudden they go through and they're like, oh, you know, um, so it's it's remarkable, you know, and it's a way to actually get communities healthy, you know, even even limiting beliefs, you know, you can reframe self-limiting beliefs, you know, because a lot of times those are attached to emotions, whether it's a belief about money or a self-esteem issue, you know, somebody told that second grade girl that she's ugly when she was a little kid and then they grow into this beautiful woman but they still feel ugly because they revert back to what they felt as a second grade kid you know so there's this has got so many different applications it's it's just absolutely mind-blowing when you see the transformations and how quickly the transformations are we, we've tried to simplify this as best we can so that i can train a veteran army navy air force marine or i can train a cop or a firefighter to do this and we could really become our own solution. Now, it's not a silver bullet. You know, if you find somebody who's been struggling with PTSD for a decade or 20 years or more, they may still need to go do therapy. They may need to find out how do they interact with their families again or how do they interact with community again. But when you take the 800 pound gorilla off their back, that that 800 pound rucksack with all that trauma in there, and all the emotions and you, you have them drop the ruck. Now they can actually do all the cognitive work because You've, you've addressed the issues at the subconscious level. Now their conscious brain can start interacting and find ways to improve their quality of life outside of those trauma emotions, because that's the problem with traditional therapy is you're trying to fight 
that 90% of that brain power, that subconscious with 10% of the brain and it doesn't work. You know, it's like taking that, you know, a little wide receiver and let, letting them go head to head with a defensive tackle. It doesn't work. But when you get to the root and you disconnect those emotions, now they can actually get the real work done. So the last question I have for you, Dan, is I want to talk about leadership because uh, through the interview, you mentioned a few times about leadership. And I think leadership is everything, whether you're in the military or uh, running a nonprofit organization like 220 or, you know, become a leader of yourself and to your family. Uh, I think I think there's no better person to ask than a person like you, because, you know, you went through so many challenges and, you know, you were a leader to your troop. Uh, when you were hurting, you're still leading your troops. And uh, certainly from your story, uh, you're definitely a leader to yourself and how you overcame challenges and went from the darkest moment, from wanting to suicide, you know, being an alcoholic, now having an amazing cause and purpose to helping and serving others. And, uh, and to me, that's a, you know, true inspirational story to me. Uh, would you mind to give our audience uh, a little bit about your advice and feedbacks. How can someone improve their leadership skill and becoming the ultimate version of themselves? I guess that's my final question for you. So obviously if you're if you're seeking leadership, you know, leaders read, I would do a lot of self-study, but you need to be willing to be vulnerable with the people who are subordinate to you. Um, you know, I've worked with, you know, high ranking individuals and I'm, my advice to them is, if you express to your subordinates that, hey, you, you had your own struggles, it will move mountains in order to make them actually be willing to, to ask for help. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a firm believer there's two types of people in this world. There are people who are moving away from pain and there are people that are moving towards pleasure. 80% of society is moving away from, whereas, you know, we disconnect those anchors and we move toward. So, you know, Whatever you think you can or can't do, you're absolutely correct. I think Henry Ford has one of the most profound statements in leadership. If you believe you can do it, you can. If you believe you can't, you can't, all right? It's, it's pure and simple. So the negative thoughts you know, that you have, the self-doubt that you have, you gotta crush that because leadership requires you to be able to move to action in ways that you know, people below you may not be able to do. Um, you know, and, and that's kind of what we do in the military. You know, we lead from the front. You know, don't sit in the back and point directions and say, do this. You know, leaders actually get out there and do the work with their subordinates to become a better, uh, more thriving, you know, business entity, whether it's in the entrepreneurship or whether you're running a nonprofit, you've got to be willing to, um, to put it out there, you know, put your rank on the table uh, and stand by what you do. And then whenever your team succeeds, you have to be willing to allow them to accept the, um, the accolades for it because that is the most powerful way to move them to action is when they do something well, let them get the credit for it. You know, that's the way I look at it. That's that's pretty much it. I really enjoyed the interview, Dan. Uh, despite the challenges that you guys go through, you persevere and push through so that others can overcome PTSD. Just Wish Foundation and I, as its founder, support you 100%. And that's why we would like to make this donation to your organization. And thank you for sharing your story, Dan. And thank you for all that you do for our veterans, first responders, and others who continue to struggle, but now have hope. With everyday heroes such as yourself rallying behind them. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much. And you know, you'll be hearing from me very soon. See you then. Mr. Wu. Appreciate it, Mr. Wu. Thank you. Take care.